Okay, we're just gonna get straight into this. You've read the title, you know what this is about, and perhaps that alone makes you want to dislike the video and leave, and I guess I can't really blame you. But despite that, this is a topic that I've wanted to cover for a while now. Ignoring the obvious context and circumstances, Lost Prophets genuinely are one of my favorite bands, but because of that elephant in the room, you can't really say that anymore, and mentioning them has become a taboo of sorts, and honestly, that's a shame. Now I have to make this clear, all praise given in this video is given to the music and the music only, separating the art from the artist. I am not defending Watkins or what he did by any means and I will also be refraining from referring to or mentioning his criminal actions throughout the rest of this video because that is not what it's about. The focus here is on the music that his band has left us with, a band which had five other members mind you. Now despite this, I just know that some people will still not be okay with it, and I guess that's what I get for tackling such a forbidden subject like this. But without any more further ado, let's just get into the video. Last Prophets were formed in the small town of Pontypri, Wales in 1997, originally as nothing more but a side project from two members of local metalcore band Public Disturbance. Guitarist Mike Lewis and drummer Ian Watkins would try out different roles here, with the former initially playing bass and the latter abandoning the drum kit to become the vocalist. The pair would eventually leave Public Disturbance to focus on Lost Prophets full time and were joined by guitarist Lee Gaze and drummer Mike Chiplin, with bassist Stuart Richardson joining the lineup after producing some of the band's demos, allowing Lewis to return to guitar duty. Initially, the band also included DJ Stepsack, though he would depart the group in 2000 and be replaced by Jamie Oliver. And with this, the outfit's key pieces were assembled, as the drummer role would be the only spot in the group that would not remain consistent throughout the rest of their run, later being filled by Ilan Rubin around the release of their third album before Luke Johnson would take over drumming duties for their final years. But let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. Back to the humble beginnings. At this point, the band was still nothing more than just your typical group of small town lads having a go at their larger than life musical dreams, merely hoping that maybe, just maybe, they could be that one in a million. The band's gigs and demos earned them some traction around the UK scene, eventually leading to them signing with independent label Visible Noise Records in 1999. The signing was followed by a hasty recording process in which the band essentially was forced to just take their demo work and turn it into an album in about a week. The result of this would be the band's debut, The Fake Sound of Progress. Originally released in 2000, the album would be re-recorded and remade the following year, with this 2001 version being the one that most people are familiar with. <laughs> Now despite the band's unsatisfaction surrounding its rushed creation, the album would help Lost Prophets enter the mainstream picture of the UK rock scene in 2001. Led by the record's two singles, album opener Shinobi vs Dragon Ninja and the title track, both of which enjoyed good radio play. The former of the two even managed to enter the alternative chart in the US, and it's not hard to see why. It's a rapid, no-nonsense punch in the face that wastes no time kicking things off. Clocking in at under three minutes, it's short, sweet, and served as a great introduction to the band at the time. The album itself, while rough around the edges, was a very strong debut. Sure, it lacked the polish and maturity that Lost Prophets would gain later, but it more than made up for it with its youthful energy and eagerness. This is Lost Prophets in their most raw and pure form, all the while doing a great job of showcasing the strong musicianship present in the band. You could say what you want about the music, but there was no doubt that these guys were talented, and the great instrumentation would remain a staple of the Welsh rocker's sound. Lyrically, the album deals a lot with the band members' younger years, whether that be their rebellious side or just nostalgically looking back at them, like on the aforementioned Shinobi. The disc also features interludes in between songs, an element which the band would make use of again on their later work, and it's something that I personally always enjoyed, as I feel it truly makes the album feel that much more connected, like a more coherent and complete package. I almost can't bring myself to only listen to a song or two, as I just feel the need to listen to the whole thing start to finish. 
The title track is probably my favorite cut from the record, but the song quality stays very consistent from cover to cover, with a couple of more laid-back moments scattered around in between some of the heavier tracks like Cobra Kai. Maybe some of it has not aged perfectly, with this release probably being the closest the band ever were to straight-up new metal, and we all know that the general opinion on that genre is still very much split within the rock community, but there is certainly a lot to like here still, and especially if you are a fan of the genre like me. Overall, while certainly far from my favorite Lost Prophets album, the fake sound of progress is a strong effort, and it did a very good job of introducing an act that would remain a constant in the scene for years to come. Again, it might not be perfect, as I also feel that there are a few moments in the later part of the disc where some of the songs blend together a little bit, and Ian's vocals aren't always super consistent, but those are nitpicks if anything, especially considering that this was the outfit's full-length debut. So Lost Prophets finally had their foot in the door, already becoming a known name in Britain and even managing to subtly creep into the American market as well. However, the band members were still left with an unsatisfied itch from their debut release, one that they would make sure they were going to get rid of on their second album. This time, they were out to make a statement, eager to prove that they were more than just another flash in the pan and that they were here to stay. The outfit would move the recording process to the States this time around, Los Angeles to be exact, and what would follow would be the group's 2004 effort, Start Something. Now I'm not gonna beat around the bush here. This is one of my favorite albums of all time. I genuinely think it's borderline perfect front to back. The band ironed out every imperfection and put their all into every single song, creating the best possible album that they could make. I can't stress enough how much I love this record. Everything just fits together so well. Tracks flow into each other seamlessly and every single one of them is memorable in its own way. The band again makes great use of interludes, gluing every piece together to form an overall package that just feels right. This is an album that I can always come back to, no matter the mood or time of day. And never would I ever feel the need to skip over a track. From the awesome, energy-filled opener, We Still Kill the Old Way, all the way to the spacey, atmospheric, dreamlike album closer, Sway, which takes the listener on an epic journey of sounds. There is absolutely zero filler. I frankly cannot fully express my love for this album in just words. I can't fold it for anything at all. It has high energy when needed and slows down at just the right moments without ever taking away any momentum from the overall package. The biggest hit from the album was track 3, Last Train Home, and it might arguably be Lost Prophet's most well-known song, period. It's an uplifting anthem that personally never fails to pick me up from the ground, and I also can't help but sing along to its lyrics every time I hear it. The song charted very well in the UK, but also helped the band fully break through into the American market, as it topped the Billboard Alternative Songs chart. Last Train Home wasn't the only successful single from Start Something, however, far from it. Burn Burn, Make a Move and Last Summer also became some of the band's most recognizable tracks, all charting well on radio and becoming and remaining concert staples for the rest of the band's run. The record's fourth single, Last Summer in particular, is one that always stood out to me. It's a song that always gets me nostalgic whenever I listen to it, even though I don't even really have any memories connected to it specifically. It's a track about looking back at all the good times you've had with your friends during summertime, something which I'm sure many could relate to, myself included. It's a very feel-good song, but also has a bittersweet touch to it. I can't really explain it properly, but I just can't help but get a bit emotional whenever I listen to it. The album's title, Start Something, apart from referring to the fact that the band was left unsatisfied with their debut and how it didn't accurately represent their musical ability, hence meaning that this record was the real start of their musical journey, also showcased the main recurring theme on this album, that being taking control of your life and chasing your dreams. As the album's title track says, stop dreaming, start something. And that's the general message of the disc, with many inspiring and uplifting tracks, anthems for all underdogs and outsiders who maybe felt like they didn't fit in or weren't good enough. A line from the record's first track sums it up, even through your doubts, we will still be here. 
it all comes over very genuine as well, especially since the band were underdogs themselves. They were just a group of friends from a small town who worked hard and managed to make it to the top, and their story is reflected in this record's message. I mentioned before that this is an album that I can listen to in any mood, but it definitely is most effective whenever you're down and in need of a good pick-me-up. Now I could start naming all of my favorite cuts from the record, but I'd just end up going through the entire track list. I will give a mention to one of the underrated deeper cuts though, namely track 7, Hello Again. It's a bit of a slower song with an epic chorus featuring lyrics that I personally have been able to really relate to, about salvaging a relationship with a troubled someone, essentially saying that everything could be forgiven and you both could start again, and all it takes is for that person to just say hello again. Damn. Start Something would go on to sell over two and a half million copies worldwide, going platinum in the UK and gold in the US. If it wasn't already the case before, it was now. Lost Profits had arrived. The Welsh small town lads had truly become rock stars. Releasing a worthy follow-up to a career record is a heavy feat for any artist. I mean, you heard my opinion on Start Something. So how does a band continue on from that without crumbling under the expectations? Well, instead of trying to better or even match its predecessor, the band's third album, Liberation Transmission, would take things in a bit of a different direction. Released in 2006 and produced by legendary producer Bob Rock, known best for his work with Metallica, Liberation Transmission adopted a more mainstream sound with various 2000s pop-punk and emo influences in the album's core elements, like song structure and guitar tone. There are no interludes and the songs feature more poppy hooks and sing-along anthemic choruses, perhaps taking inspiration from the success of Last Train Home. While the shift in style did not sit well with everyone, I personally feel that the release manages to perfectly ride the line of becoming more accessible without going completely soft, and it also managed to somewhat refresh the band's sound. The stylistic shift also proved that the band were talented enough to change, but still be just as good, as once again, I do not think that there is a single skippable song on here. Tracks like The Rebellious, The New Transmission, and the super catchy album opener Everyday Combat proved that the guys still had attitude, while slower songs like the heartbreaking 4AM Forever, ballad album closer Always Always, and the record's lead single and one of the band's most well-known tracks in general, Rooftops, kept everything in balance. These lighter moments are spread out across the album in such a way that the overall package never loses any steam, and everything still manages to flow well despite the lack of interlude. One thing that definitely did not change here was the quality of the songwriting, as the lyrics remain as strong as ever, with this album having some of the band's most quotable lines in my opinion, all throughout the album. Additionally, the pop-influenced hooks made for some unforgettable choruses that you can't help but sing along with. It's just a very fun album to listen to, I think that's the easiest way to put it. Sure, the material on offer on Liberation Transmission perhaps didn't scream out revolution like its album title, but Lost Prophets were able to pull off the sound with flying colors, managing to stand out enough and remain memorable. And while the more manufactured and accessible approach divided opinion amongst fans, it did seem to pay off for the band, as Liberation Transmission would debut at number one in the UK, alongside receiving another platinum certification, further cementing LP's place at the top of the scene. At first, the group wanted to quickly follow up Liberation Transmission with another release. However, reality turned out to be a lot more complicated than that. The band went through a difficult studio process to say the least, with multiple delays and even scrapping a whole album's worth of material at one point. The higher-ups and the band themselves had differing perspectives on what direction the new music should take, and the difficulties would lead to Lost Profits leaving their American label and choosing to have bassist Stuart Richardson co-produce the album, as of course he had previously done the same for the band's demos in the 90s. The result of this would eventually be the band's fourth album, The Betrayed, which was finally released in early 2010.
The band members described the Betrayed as the first project where they had total creative freedom and were able to just be themselves and make the music that they wanted to make. Thematically, it is probably the band's darkest album, especially if you take a deeper dive into its lyrics. But the music does still hold on to some of the sing-songy, poppy elements from Liberation Transmission. And overall, the record is actually quite a stylistic roller coaster, as it basically tugs on the listener's sleeves from a bunch of different directions during its 47-minute runtime. With the songs ranging from edgy ass-kickers to Motowny anthems to even somewhat progressive territory, I feel it's safe to say that the betrayed is Lost Prophet's most experimental release. It's not the end of the world, but I can see it from here and where we belong were the two big singles from the record. And while they certainly both are highlights, the album does have a bunch of great deeper cuts too. And again, I feel that the overall package is very strong from start to finish. The band returned to their roots and brought back the use of interludes in between tracks after not doing so on their previous effort. And this again only helps make the album feel like a more complete journey. With the opener, if it wasn't for hate, we'd be dead by now and the closer, the light that shines twice as bright, acting as sort of intro and outro tracks respectively, making the album feel like a very cinematic experience. The latter of the two is actually one of my all-time favorite Lost Prophets songs. It has a great build-up, emotional hook and epic climax that eventually fades out to finish the album beautifully. I would go as far as to call it one of the best album closers I've ever heard. Other highlights include the loud and punk influence Destroyer Destroyer, the fun and energetic Next Stop Atrocity, and the underrated A Better Nothing, which was originally planned to be the record's fourth single. But again, this is definitely another album from the band that I feel should be listened to in its entirety. Now entering the final chapter of Lost Prophets, in the early 2010s the band would leave longtime UK label Visible Noise Records and sign with Epic for their fifth studio album, Weapons, which would eventually release in April of 2012. Now little did everyone know at the time, this would go on to be the band's final ever release, making it all the more interesting in retrospect, considering it came out mere months before the group's eventual downfall. Now despite that, there's nothing too crazy here. At the time of its release, critics called Weapons the band's most forgettable work. And while I do not necessarily disagree with that statement, I do feel that there is still a lot to like here, as this more streamlined and by the numbers album still has some of my favorite Lost Prophets tracks, like the energetic anthem We Bring an Arsenal, the feel-good ballad Jesus Walks, the nostalgic A Song for Where I'm From, and the emotional and uplifting Some Days to name a few. Overall, the record plays it pretty safe and never takes any real risks, but it's certainly more than solid still. And the lyrics also remain strong and powerful as always, with Track Free Another Shot being an underrated example that resonated with me in particular. Thematically, the album keeps itself within known territory for the group, with tracks about topics such as rebellion, love and nostalgia. I always saw Weapons as a bit of a combination of the band's two previous albums, taking the poppy mainstream interludeless vibe from Liberation Transmission and combining it with some of the thematic elements from The Betrayed, although not as dark, replacing that with a bit more of a summary vibe. Again, not the band's best work, but I feel it definitely deserved its place in their discography, and perhaps it would have gone on to perform better on the charts if not for what was to come. But yeah. We have reached the end of the road. After some final tours throughout the rest of 2012, this was it for Lost Prophets. The band was actually planning on coming back with a quick follow-up to Weapons, as during an interview with NME in November of that year, it was revealed that they had already written five new songs for a new album, which they hoped to bring out the next summer. Though of course, these tracks would never get to see the light of day, as only a month later, everything came crashing down. So yeah, perhaps in a different timeline we got a 6th Lost Profits record in 2013. Well, no point in wondering about that now, is there? These days, Lost Profits are nothing more but a sour, distant memory for most, now being known as the band that shall not be named. What can I really say that hasn't been said already? It's just a shame how everything had to play out. All the talent, all the success, the awards, the dreams, all thrown in the bin. 
However, I do not think that the music should be left forgotten, especially considering its quality or just the fact that I have not been able to come across another act which has been able to fill its void. Not even No Devotion, the band which essentially was the immediate continuation of Lost Prophets with a new singer, as it was a huge departure from the sound for which the Welsh rockers were previously known for. But what can you do? But that was it for this video. I know that this is not an easy or perhaps even comfortable topic to talk about these days, but I hope that I was able to do it well enough. Thanks for tuning in, my name is FAD, and I'm gonna see you guys in my next video. Bye.